This video is a, um, a quick review of energy conservation and also one more example of using our LOL diagram to diagram forms of energy through different periods of time in a scenario. As a reminder about what we said about um, energy and its conservation, we have um, primarily and first off the principle of the conservation of energy which we mean all of the energy in the universe, add it all up, that value stays constant. That's the sum total of all energy. Um, but we focus a lot, um, at least in, in our introduction to, to energy, just on mechanical energy, which remember is just all the kinetic, gravitational potential, and spring potential energy. So that doesn't include all the other forms of, of energy like thermal, for instance, or acoustic, sound energy. Um, important points about the conservation of mechanical energy is that in an isolated system, so it's not being affected by other stuff, isolated system, uh, the mechanical energy is going to stay constant. That means before um, and later in time, earlier and later in time, it's going to have the same total amount of mechanical energy so long as the system is isolated. It remains untouched, unmessed up by other forces that could act on it. Um, if that's the case, then in our diagram, no arrows will point into or out of the system circle. Um, that was the circle or the O in the LOL diagram. Um, if a force like friction or air resistance is present, um, energy can be dissipated, or it could be dissipated in the form of sound. These are just examples. Friction is the most common one we'll have to deal with. Um, if a force like that is uh, present and acts on the system, energy can be dissipated, and we call that E-dis for short and we represent it with an arrow pointing out of our system. So it's leaving the system, this dissipated energy, and going into the environment. Um, and in this case, mechanical energy will be transferred out of the system, and mechanical energy will not be conserved. You'll have less than what you started with. Um, another possibility, we could have a force outside the system that could do work on the system. It acts on the system over some distance and does work. We represent that with an arrow pointing into the system circle causing the system to gain energy. Again, mechanical energy would not be conserved because uh, we would have more at, in the um, later L, um, at a later point in time. If we had energy go into the system, we would end up with more than what we started with, so the mechanical energy is not constant, it's not conserved, we gained some. It's important always to identify whether the mechanical energy is being conserved or not in a scenario, and then accurately depict or represent that in your LOL diagram. So we have an example down here to do um, another LOL diagram. And in this one, um, I'm going to say, uh, assume um, mechanical energy is, cons is conserved. So we're going to say mechanical energy is conserved. And as soon as we know that to be the case, and I'm, I'm just saying that, I'm stipulating it. Otherwise, I mean, you'd have something like maybe the sound produced by the spring expanding here, which is something that's going to happen. The spring's going to expand. Maybe you could lose some to um, energy uh, going into sound into the environment or maybe air resistance, but we're going to ignore those for right now. So mechanical energy is conserved in our example here. Um, and anytime we know that, we can say the initial energy at some earlier point in time is going to be equal to the final mechanical energy. Remember, capital E stands for mechanical energy, and mechanical energy is the sum of all the kinetic plus the gravitational potential plus the spring potential. Okay, so this example is one in which we do have a spring. The spring is orange. At the very beginning, I have three points in time here. At the very beginning, the spring is compressed, um, and it's being held down. Now imagine you're holding it down with your finger or there's some sort of mechanism like in a projectile launcher that keeps the spring compressed and then you can flick the trigger and in um, time 2, we'll call this one all the way on the left T1, at time 2, um, the trigger has been released and the spring has decompressed to now its normal length and this is the moment at T2 when the ball is just leaving the spring and the spring is at its normal length. It is neither compressed nor stretched. Um, and then at time three is going to be a point in time when the ball has shot up and it has reached its maximum height. So we have three points in time. Doing my LOL diagram, the first thing I want to do is I'm going to make an L for my first point in time and label K U G U S. Then I'll have an O for me to say what's in my system. Then I'll have my later point in time. My next point in time is T2. 
and I label the types of energy. And in this example, we have three periods of time. So I'm going to have one more L to represent the period of time T3 when the ball gets to its maximum height. And I make sure I label these. They're pretty much right under the things, but I'm just going to label each of these graphs T1, T2, and T3. And I'm going to say what's in my system. In this case, I have a ball. I have a spring. I have spring potential energy. I have a spring in my system. And uh, the height of the ball is changing. As the ball goes up, it is slowing down until it reaches its maximum height where its speed is zero for an instant. So we've got gravity going on. Gravita gravitational potential energy is changing. And so if we have gravitational potential energy, we must have the Earth as part of our system as well. Um, we're saying mechanical energy is conserved, so I have no arrows leaving the system circle. I have no arrows pointing into the system circle. So all of the boxes of energy that I draw in my leftmost L should be the same number of boxes I draw in my T2 L, should be the same number of boxes I draw in my T3 L. We're just showing how they get transformed from one type to another. So I look at my very beginning and I've, uh, I've got a ball that's sitting at rest on a compressed spring. It's at rest, so I have no kinetic energy. Um, I have to decide here, since I'm going to be talking about gravitational potential energy, where I should put the zero line for the gravitational potential energy. And that's always going to be um, the most convenient place to put it. And that's almost always going to be the lowest point that this object occupies vertically. So here's height. Um, let's put it. Down here, I drew these dashed height lines all the way across my pictures to make it clear. So I'm going to call this um, H1. That's the height when the ball is at position 1. Um, height 2 is the next one. That's when the spring is decompressed and the ball is just leaving the spring. And then H3 is at maximum height up there. And since H1 is the lowest one, I'm going to call that the zero line. So I'm going to say H1 will be zero. That's where we'll measure the height from, even though that's not actually the floor. Okay, so now I have UG um, to mark on my graph for T1, my L for T1, and since my height is zero at time one, then I have zero gravitational potential energy, so that's an X, and I have a compressed spring, so all of my energy is going to be US. So I'm going to put four boxes, arbitrary number of boxes, I want enough so that I can split them up though. We're just going to represent how they comparatively shift from one type of energy to another. Okay, now I have um, time two. Time two, my spring is now back to its normal length. So if it's neither stretched nor compressed, it's just at its normal length, then I have no spring potential energy. So I have an X there for US. The ball is now moving. So I do have some kinetic energy. I'm going to have to have something there. And its height has increased. It's at H2, so it's higher up than it was before. So that means I have both some kinetic and some gravitational potential energy. Um, we don't know, again, exactly how much to put because we're not calculating anything. So I'm just going to say I have some kinetic and some gravitational potential. In total, I still need four boxes because we're saying mechanical energy is conserved. No arrows are leaving or entering the system. Time three, the ball gets to the maximum height, and at the maximum height, its velocity is zero. That's something we know about the maximum height, and if its velocity is zero, its kinetic energy is zero. So I need to put an X where the K is. Nothing in kinetic. Um, gravitational potential energy, yeah, it's at its highest height, so it's definitely going to have gravitational potential. Um, there's no, the spring is decompressed, there's no energy in the spring, stored in the spring in the form of potential, so that's no. So all my energy is now UG and I need four boxes in there, two, three, four. Okay, and now I've completed my LOL diagram for this scenario, all three points of time. Um, one thing that we can point out here we'll need to know once we start calculating the exact amounts of energy or solving equations is that if this um, this is the normal length of my spring in time two which is also what it is at time three that's the normal length of the spring so you look and you see how much was it compressed uh, go look back to time one it was compressed this much that's how far it was compressed down from its unstretched position so that's the x 
in the equation for spring potential energy, one half K X squared. X is how much you compress the spring or how much you stretch it. Um, so in this case, X would be equal to H2 minus H1. There's our LOL diagram for that. We're going to do one last thing where we say, okay, the total mechanical energy here at time one is going to be all the kinetic, all the gravitational potential, and all the spring. But there is no K or UG. So all I have right here is going to be U, S at time one. And then I could write that as one half K X one squared because it's the compression of the spring that's x at time one so i'm going to label it as x1 and so that's what this compression up here would be this would be the compression at time one it's possible it could be compressed a different amount um, at some later point in time so you want to label what time that compression is at so there's the amount of mechanical energy at time one at time two we would do the same thing we'd say e2 is all the kinetic at two plus all the gravitational potential at two plus all of the spring potential at two and in this one i notice aha i have kinetic and gravitational potential so my kinetic will be one half m v2 squared the velocity at time two plus i have gravitational potential m g times h2 because it's a specific height there at time two, All right? So that's the height of the ball right there. It's at H2, so I gotta use H2 in my gravitational potential. And then I can do this for time three. The total mechanical energy at three is the kinetic at three, plus the gravitational potential at three, plus the spring potential at three. And all we have here is gravitational potential, so it's just MGH3. All right, so these are expressions for the mechanical energy at these three different points in time. And since we said the total mechanical energy is conserved, that means that the initial energy at some earlier point in time is going to be equal to the final energy at some later point in time. And for us, since we have these three points in time, we could say total mechanical energy at 1 is equal to total mechanical energy at 2 is equal to total mechanical energy at 3. And we could set any of these equations equal to one another and solve for whatever we were, we were looking for. If we needed to solve for um, V2, how fast does it leave the spring? With some other information, we could solve for that. We can use this, this principle of conservation of mechanical energy to help us solve problems. That's all.